Welcome to the 100th Monkey Radio with Tom and Ramon. Oh, wow. We have had just some amazing things going on in the last couple of weeks. I just uh, got back from East SETI a couple days ago, seeing George Kavasilis, and uh, I got to tell you guys, oh, what you see on the internet, what you see on YouTube, and all that stuff just does not give the guy justice. Uh, he is His presentation that he puts out there uh, really, really strikes to the heart of the matter. So, uh, if you have the opportunity to check him out in, uh, where's he, Chicago and Boston in the next couple of weeks, I would definitely encourage you to check him out. He, uh, you, you will not be sorry you did. Uh, he, genuine, genuine good soul. So, oh, let's see. We've got, uh, oh, Ramon's playing on the internet, on the website quite a bit here with our news. He's going to bring us up to date with that here in just a second. Posted a few new videos on there. Added a little 40-minute video I did with George there at ESETI. And uh, like I said, I'm just catching up from being gone for a week. So uh, we will uh, be posting things up there and, and bringing everybody back up to speed or getting myself back up to speed anyways. Uh, let's see. We do work on a donation basis. So uh, if you have a few bucks to drop our way, we definitely appreciate it. Don't forget, we do also have the uh, offer of the uh, tarot and the healing and the astrology services, Astrology by Claudia. And, oh, by the way, Claudia, I just wanted to mention, I'm sure you are listening, I wanted to mention that George wanted me to give you a big hello. So, hi, Claudia, from George. So, Ramon, what's been going on on the news? Uh, well, one of the uh, things that I found very, very interesting is there's um, it's the first time I've heard of it. It's a machine that turns um, water into air and the links on there. I'm sorry, air into water. <laughs> it basically takes in the humidity um, and, and, and takes out the water from the air. And some of them are 55 gallons to 100 gallons. So you have like a, a portable well. That you can carry around, so you can look at the news, and I got that from Happy News, which mm. I don't know if you guys ever had a chance to check out Happy News, but it's so much better than the regular crap we normally get programmed our minds with. And I just, I just love that site. I just love yeah. It. Um, the other news is Facebook will be down November fifth. Uh, anonymous <laughs> will bring down Facebook. So let's see what happens with that. Keep your eyes out. One last thing is uh, Nibiru Insider and his astronomer confirmed location of Nib Nibiru live on the air, slightly behind Ellen. So press the link on that. Uh, what I've heard about that, and we'll discuss that with our guests, is that some people believe that Ellen is blue Kachina and whatever is behind Ellen is red Kachina. So we'll ask our guest. But who is our guest? Well, our guest is a very well known person whose family originates from Spain and then moved to Cuba, moved off to Puerto Rico, and he ended up in the States afterwards. Who is the person I'm talking about? He's been doing his show for. Three years since 2008. Um, I forgot who his first guess is. This is all off the top of my head. I'm <laughs> saying this. Let's bring in Mr. Mel Fabregas. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Hello, guys. Great to be here. Hello, Ramon. <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing tonight, Mel? <laughs> I love the laughter, guys. <laughs> No, this, uh, this is a really serious show. No laughing. That's right. I know. Yeah, yeah. We we are professionals, so yes, we're real professionals. So <laughs> humor is a, a totally imperative, especially these days. Absolutely, absolutely. So, Mel, uh, first of all, I want you. Uh, uh, that bio was a little uh, interesting. Uh, um, l most people don't really know much about Mel Fabregas. They know you do that show. And I'm, if they've listened to all your shows, I'm sure that they've gotten a little bit more background than, than what most people. But uh, give me a little bit more. What did you do before uh, you started the uh, Veritas show? 
That, that's the big question. Everybody asks me, you know, what did you do before Veritas? And before that, uh, I used to be in the corporate world. I, I used to work for a Fortune 100 company. I, was, I started as a financial analyst, and I was traveling around the world, spent 13 years, 13 moves. I was in Asia, California, Mexico, you name it. And I, uh, I always had a fascination for the paranormal. And I'm just going to give you a, a little bit of the background not to poor people, but in one of my stops uh, during the early 90s, I was sent to Mexico during the implementation of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is frowned upon by many, even by me now, uh, although I was there to promote it. But anyway, during that time, I uh, arrived in Mexico, but just before that, I was in my, living in Miami, Florida, and we had uh, Hurricane Andrew. And at the time, at 11.30 p.m., my alarm uh, the, the house alarm would go off at 11.30 p.m. all the time. And uh, one night I decided to remove that alarm, to remove the cables just because I couldn't handle it, that every time I would look and it, it was something vibrating in my, my uh, uh, bedroom window. So the day I removed that at 11.30 p.m., I heard a bing as if somebody took a piece of metal and banged it to the, in the uh, stairway railing. So I went running and I touched it and it was vibrating. So I thought I was going nuts. You know, what, what's going on here? 1130. Say, so uh, Hurricane Andrew hit and I was uh, transferred to Mexico City. And I was living in a hotel for a while. Nothing happened. But then I was moved to, to a corporate apartment. At 1130 p.m. the first night, I wake up cold and I see the curtains flapping and the windows open. And I say, you know, maybe maybe it was me who left the windows open. So I closed them. The next day, I made sure that the bars were closed. It was a metal window. At 11.30 p.m., the windows open again. The next day, I go to the office, and I was hiring personnel. And I uh, bump into this lady. She she actually looked like a witch. No offense to, to witches out there, but she looked like a witch. And uh, she came to the office and applied for a job, and we got along. And then I don't know why. I hired her on the spot. Usually I take my time to, to hire people. But that one lady, I just hired her on the spot. I, I just got a good vibe. And she said to me, sir, you look a little bit distraught. Is everything okay? And I was just thinking of the 1130 issues from the night before. And, you know, just met the lady. Why is she asking me personal questions? So anyway, I said, yeah, this is what's happening. And she said, can I borrow your pocket pen? And I'll bring it back in the morning. And uh, I've had some paranormal experiences in the past, but, but this one was a big one. She took my pen. The next day, she comes back and started telling me things about me that nobody knew but me. And that was just incredible. Anyway, we developed a, a good friendship. And about, I would say, nine months later, um, she came to the office uh, crying. And I said, well, what's going on? Why are you crying? And she said, well, because you're leaving. You're leaving Mexico. We really love you here. And I said, well, why am I leaving? I'm having a great time. I love the, the country and I want to stay. Like, no, 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 you're going to get a phone call. You're going to receive a phone call from somebody and you will leave. Anyway, not even a couple of days later, the Mexico peso devaluation happened. And my uh, boss in San Francisco called me and said, hey, we need to get you out of Mexico because things are going to get pretty bad. And I said, yeah, yeah, I agree. So I go to the office. Nobody knew that my boss had called me. And the lady came to me and said, you received your phone call, didn't you? <laughs> and I said, oh, my wow. God. You know, <laughs> and through the time I knew, I knew her, she was always doing things like that, that, that would floor me. Anyway, she told me, look, let me tell you some of the things that will happen to you in the next year and the next you know, decades. And she said, you're going to lose a next of kin. You will move eventually a lot of places, but you're going to end up living in a place that's very hot. It's beautiful, a lot of nature around it. So, you know, she described a desert. You're going to marry somebody that looks like this and like that. And essentially, she described my wife. She described the place where I live. And my father died a few months later. So she was right in, in that I was going to lose the next of kin. But she said the most important of all, and the last thing would be that you will be informing the world. That will be your duty. And I said, wait, wait a minute. I, I get the losing the next, uh, next of kin. Everybody has to die. Uh, yeah. You know, that you're going to get married, that you're going to live in a hot place. There are many hot places around the world. But informing the world, explain. And she said, in due time, it will be revealed to you. 
So anyway, I left uh, Mexico. I, I arrived in California. And the next Monday, I called the office just to say hello to Amalia. That was her name. And they said, well, ever since you left, she never came back. It was actually a week or two later. I called her at home, and her phone number was disconnected. And now, many years later, I just think that something, somebody was placed there to, to tell me. But it, one of the things she gave me was a little red pouch. And she said to me, a little, you know, take this little red pouch, always keep it with you, you know, maybe in your wallet. It has some little stones inside. And she said, don't ever open it, because when you do, things are going to start getting bad. Anyway, a couple of years later, I was being promoted. I was going around the world. You know, I was really enjoying my job. And one day, I'm in, in New York, actually, from all places, from one, and I'm uh, putting gas in a snowstorm. And all of a sudden, I'd get to my hotel, and I realized that I had lost my wallet. I dropped it in the snow. And uh, in the morning, I get a, and I said to myself, oh, my God, please, whoever got the, the wallet, don't open that little bag, that little pouch. So I get a phone call from the police, and they said, sir, we found your wallet. Come and pick it up at the station. So I did. I went there, no money, that's okay. But the first thing I did was to look at that pouch. And the pouch was open. Uh -oh. And I said, oh, no. The first thing I did was drop it in the first trash can I found. I didn't want to deal with it. So even though I had a great position, very lucrative, I was making the company millions of dollars, I go back to California. The first thing was my boss said, we need to talk. And I get there and he said, your position has been eliminated. And I said, oh, no, the pouch. Mm -hmm. So after that, <laughs> things started getting really bad. Uh, they moved me to Arizona. And uh, one thing led to another. I just couldn't stand the fact that they wanted to move me again. And I said no. And, and I, I finally uh, quit the company, body business, got married all in one year. And now I realize that maybe that pouch was open for a reason because it really made me be who I am now. So that's, that's most recently. When I was a child, I, the first thing happened to me, I almost drowned. And um, after that, I was run over by a car when I was 14. I should have died then and there. Two months later, I was run over by another car. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> uh, then this I moved, is in Puerto Rico? This is in Puerto Rico. Uh, as a child, about seven years old. Let me tell you another where, story. Where in Puerto Rico did you grow up? Fiona? San Juan. San Juan. Okay. Yeah, uh, but be, I just I just jumping around because I'm trying to give you the best stories. And this story I always tell people because it was my very feels uh, first paranormal story. One day uh, I was having a dream about this little girl in the school. I had a crush on this little girl. I was about seven years old. So I had the dream. The dream basically said you need to go from your house to her house, and the, these are the directions. And I woke up in the morning and I said, what? was that. So I go to school, return in the afternoon, and I told my mom, hey, I'm going out to play. So instead of playing, I just walked and walked and walked for a, a couple of miles. And I went directly to a house, the house that the dream told me to go to. So I knocked on the door, and a lady opens the door and says, son, I, uh, are you lost? And I said, no, I'm here to see Mary. That's not her name, but I'm here to see Mary. And she said, sure, let me get her for you. And I said, oh, my God, I'm really in her house. And then here she comes and says, you know, Mel, what are you doing here? And I said, I, I just came to say hello. So I was so embarrassed that I just said, okay, goodbye now. And I left walking really fast with my head down thinking, <laughs> who can I talk to? Who can I say? I had a dream the night before that told me to get there. And that, that was my very first experience. Another one, a, a couple of years before, actually, I was walking with a, a great aunt and uh, on my street. And I see a, a really pretty house. I have a video on the internet that shows exactly that moment. And I, 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 I pointed to the house and I said, that house looks just like your house in Cuba. And she looked at it and I started crying. And I said, why are you crying? She said, because that house looks just like my house in Cuba. So as a child, I was thinking something's different with me. But every time I would go to school, I was ridiculed. In 1979, I was about uh, 11. Uh, Hold on one I, second, Amal. Yeah, he's he's he breaking up for you too. Yeah. How's this now? Much better. Okay, okay so that happens. All right. Um, I was in seventh grade and I had a. I'm just telling you all these stories to put things in perspective. But uh, I had a biology teacher who said, "Hey, close your books. Today we're not going to be talking about uh, biology. 
you are going to tell us anything, your story, or are you going to ask me a question, any question you want? And of course, I've always had these overly developed sense of wonder. And my question was, how could I communicate with extraterrestrials? Hmm. And everybody <laughs> looked at me, oh my God, this guy's crazy. And she, <laughs> she looked at me and said, hmm, that's a great question. So all the kids were like, oh, she's taking him seriously. And she said to me, "Take." A, she was an engineer, an electrical engineer. And she said, take a radio, an AM radio preferably, and put it, put the station in between stations where you can hear the white noise. Sit down and start thinking really hard, really hard that you want to make contact. And maybe one day you will. And everybody looked at me, wow, that was really cool. I never succeeded with it, but anyway, that was a, a great one. Anyway, I moved to Miami, 1991. Uh, my job uh, transferred me. That was my first move out of Puerto Rico. And a drunk driver hit me head on. Nothing happened to me. Um, you know, like that, I had a few more accidents. And I keep uh, playing with death and nothing happens. In uh, 1995, after my dad died, I, I returned to California, and I was tempted to go to, to uh, a video store to rent uh, UFO movies. I just got tired of the ridicule on talking about it. But that day, I decided I want to start watching movies. So I went and I rented uh, Communion with Lee Strebers and uh, Travis Walton's uh, Fire in the Sky. That's so cool. after I watched those two movies, I said, well, I really need to get back into this. And, you know, I, I started reading more books. Then uh, fast forward after I left the company, I always wanted to start my own show. But, you know, conservative Catholic family, you don't talk about these subjects. Then 9-11 came along. And I was totally one of those patriots watching Fox News saying, yeah, yeah, whoever did it, we need to go and bump the heck out of them. I was, a, I was asleep. So in 2000, and th I think it was 2005, one of my brothers sent me a presentation showing the Pentagon and how it was impossible that a plane hit the Pentagon. And the first reaction I had was calling my brother and telling him, how dare you even imply that a well-intended government had anything to do with this? Hmm. <laughs> I, I didn't talk to him for a couple of months. I, I said, you know, how, how are you doing this? But in silence, I started looking and looking. And I started looking at the Reichstag fire in Germany, which was the equivalent of 9-11. Of and I found that they had their fatherland security. We have homeland security. They had their enabling act. We have the Patriot Act. And I said, oh, my God, 9-11 is our Reichstag fire, and the Nazi script is, is continuing here. And that's when I started talking to, to friends and family and, and being disinvited from social gatherings. And my wife would tell me, you need to shut up. Right. You're costing us <laughs> friends and family. They're just thinking that I'm married to a weirdo. And I <laughs> understand everybody's just going along and repeating the same script. Anyway, in 2008, I, I had a dream, which I hardly do. I hardly have any dreams. And the dream was take action. Take action. That, those were the words, take action. So in the morning, I wake up and I say, well, what was that all about? So I turn on the TV, which I hardly do. And on TV, CNN, Fox, MSNBC, anywhere, BBC, I saw Milton Torres. You probably know who Milton Torres is. Right. Yeah. The Air Force uh, pilot who in 1957 was ordered to shoot down a UFO. And I said, oh, look at this. The, the British Ministry of Defense is releasing this information. And nobody was really asking him any questions. They were just, you know, this is a great story, blah, blah, but no questions. And you still have the giggle factor. And I said, I need to speak with this man. He's a brave man, and he probably kept this secret for so long. I need to do this. In less than 10 minutes, don't ask me how, I found his phone number. So I, I was going to call him. And my wife is walking by, and I said, hey, I need to create a name because he's not going to talk to Mel. He's probably getting calls from the media all the time. So I said to my wife, help me come up with a name that deals with conspiracies, UFOs, alternative health, you know, basically all those. And she said, uh, how about Veritas? And I said, great. So I grabbed the phone, and I called Dr. Torres, and I said, I'm Mel from Veritas, and I would like to uh, interview you. And he said, sure, let's do it. So tomorrow. The next day, I, I did the interview December the 4th. On December the 5th, I uploaded it to a few forums out there. In less than 24 hours, I was flooded. Hundreds of emails from people saying, 
where, where else can we see, listen to your show? And I said to myself, what show? This was just a souvenir phone call that I wanted for me. But they thought it was a show because I, I pretended to be from a show. So uh, all of a sudden, I get a phone call from uh, an email, a phone call from Stephen Bassett. Uh, he says, hey, I'd love the interview. I would love to to have uh, Milton Torres at the X conference in, in Washington. And uh, can you please put me in touch with him? And I said, of course. Can you please uh, allow me to interview you too? And that was the first real interview. And after I, I did that one, I had to create a website rather quickly. And I was going to do the show every two weeks. But so many people said, please, please do it once a week. And, and I have businesses. I am a business owner. And, you know, I don't have the 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 capacity of doing this every day. Otherwise, I would. I would drop everything and do it for free. But um, that's how Veritas started. So I just gave you a, some background of the things I've gone through. And how many shows do you have under your belt now? Uh, they're cl getting close to 150. Wow. Hmm. I haven't stopped one single week ever since I started. Nice. Nice, yeah. Where, where, where were we up to, Tom? 40? I think you, you will be our 40th episode. Yeah, you'll be our 40th episode. Yeah. And you guys are having a great reputation, by the way. And, and, and we have some synchronicities here because you've had somebody very dear to my heart in, in your show, and you know her, uh, Crystal Clark. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I speak, let, let's start there. Um, I've been, I'm three quarters of the way on, on uh, 102. Who are we really 102 when tomorrow comes? Uh -huh. That book has blown my mind. What, what's your feeling on on that? Well, as Crystal knows, every week I have to read an average of 400 uh, pages. For example, tomorrow I have uh, Gwen Olsen and, and Dr. Sherry Tempenny, Confessions from a Drug Pusher, somebody who lived, who worked in the pharmaceutical industry. So every week I have to read about four to 500 pages. So I told Crystal that once I have her back on the show, I will start reading the new material. Uh, I don't know if you know the story, but... I receive books almost on a daily basis, and this is back in uh, 09, uh, late 09. I had a stack in my office, you know, probably about three feet tall of books. And then I was looking at the at the book, you know, I wonder which one should I grab now. And the one that stuck out the most was this big book called "Who Are We Really 101." And I grabbed it and I said, "That's a great title, very catchy." And I started reading it, thinking that I was going to give it 10 minutes just to, to browse it. I couldn't put it down. I read the whole thing. And then I said, I need to get in touch with this woman. So I, we corresponded. And she told me the story of how, I don't know if I can tell this publicly, but basically one of the signals was that once she received a contact from somebody who read the book and wanted to have her on the show. There was a signal for her to start promoting it. So one thing led to another, and we did four hours. We divided them in two shows. Before her, the only, can I say, spiritual topic-related person that I had on the show was Robert Morning Sky. But mainly I was doing shows on UFOs only. She was the one who, can we say, snapped me out of it nice. and, and really exposed me to spirituality. You know, remember, I grew up a Catholic. So after that, I, I frown upon <laughs> religion, unfortunately, because nobody could answer my questions. And they would send me to the principal's office if I had a question that they couldn't answer. So to me, I didn't want to deal with spirituality because I thought that would turn some people off. But after I had her on, I said, wait a minute, there's some uncharted territory here that I need to explore. And if you look at my guests, after I had Crystal on, I basically touch every every subject under the sun, you know, spirituality and anything that has to do with discovery, to being being sovereign. And ever since we did the show, we've become friends, and I look forward to having her again uh, late this year. And then I heard that she was with you, and you guys did a, ter a terrific show with her, too. Yeah, we yeah, did, it, uh, what, five shows with her? Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, we did her. We uh, had her on every month, and uh, it was awesome. Uh, just amazing yes. woman, amazing woman. Yeah, actually, if it wasn't for you, we we would have never had her on because well, Tom Tom heard one of your shows and was like, "Oh, we need to get her." Let me confess, 
you know, it's interesting, and this may be happening to you too now that you have so many shows under your belt. Does it have it happened to you that you interview somebody and uh, maybe even somebody that people have, haven't heard from? Uh, you know, Crystal, it was the first time she's ever been on radio with me. You know, I had so many people thanking me. That was a great show. And this happens not only with her, but with many other shows. You know, he just breaks records and, and, and downloads. But then you have another side who says, come on, Mel, what were you thinking? You know, you have both sides of the spectrum. And what I tell people is, look, information is information. Uh, information is like a, like a restaurant buffet. You go out there, you sample what you want, and what you don't want, you leave it. But I don't want to be out here not having a guest that I think has great information just because one or two people out there may find that guest questionable. Just because you can't prove something, it doesn't mean that it may not be real. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah we, we definitely uh, don't uh, put any kind of borders on where we'll go. <laughs> so. Yeah. We're okay, well, gonna... let's real quick, uh, let's jump back in. I want to jump back into uh, a little bit of your past before uh, before the show, into your Bechtel years. Sure. And uh, this is actually comes from Rogue 2, which I know you know who that is. Sure. Uh, he, he asks, uh, oftentimes in your interviews, you reference your previous corporate life and how one of your clients was Bechtel, largest construction company in the world. You have stated multiple times that this company was involved in building underground bases. Have you ever approached anyone within the organization that would or could speak on these projects? Uh, Rogue too. He always has the greatest mm -hmm. questions. He does. He does. He's <laughs> well, awesome. Let me just let me just tell you. Uh, the company I used to work for. Uh, you probably heard of Standard and Poor's and Moody's, and and their rating, uh, the United States government downgrade to double A. Well, the company I used to work for was the parent company of Moody's. So I did my own uh, ratings myself, rating you know big companies around the world. At one point, I had a job, and that was when I was flying all over the place. This is when after I left Mexico and, and I met that witch lady and I had the best job in the world. I was, I used to leave the office on a sun, I mean my home on Sunday and would return home on a Friday. It was great that I was single back then because if you're married and you're traveling that much, there's no way you can make it work. But anyway, I, some of my, my clients were in the Midwest and, 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 and I had the West coast and the Midwest and uh, in the West coast, I had Bechtel, but I also had, in the Midwest, many large clients. One of them was Monsanto. And I can talk about Monsanto after I talk about Bechtel. Anyways, I had Bechtel. I had other, you know, I, I had uh, 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 defense contractors, uh, McDonnell Douglas. I had uh, uh, Lockheed. Every time you would go there, they would make you wear special security badges for you to be able to go to certain of their departments. And can I talk to any of those individuals about the underground bases? Absolutely not. They would probably deny it just because they were all uh, on a military need-to-know basis. And I just heard from the grapevine about those things, and I've heard from other people who were involved in those projects that these were really true. And when we hear about Donald Rumsfeld saying that they lost $2.3 trillion on September the 10th, uh, that to me is a huge crime against the citizens of the United States. And then 9-11 happens the next day. So, of course, everybody will forget that that was said the day before. But I have no doubt in my mind that this money was used for many other purposes. Yes, black projects that are needed, CIA, and uh, probably these underground bases. At the time also, I used to, to fly to Denver. This is 1995. And I at the time, they were building the, the airport. And I don't know if you remember... But that airport had a multi-million dollar budget. Well, it came out in, you know, over budget by the billions. And the rumor has it, and I've spoken to people, that there are several levels underneath the Denver airport that uh, may be the new capital of the United States. I've heard from people who say that some of the government branches are being relocated to Denver because in the future it's going to become our new capital. I had Andrew Bashago on the show uh, uh, about a year or two ago. I don't know if you know who Andrew Bashago is. Yes, right. I actually yeah. got to meet him once. Okay, well, I asked him about that, and he said to me that, yes, indeed, that 
in the future, what he saw was that the capital and all the, the monument and so on looked almost as if it was underwater, full of like green algae. And that's when I connected dots and I said, well, if what he's saying is true, then the government obviously knows something about this and maybe relocating, uh, you know, a lot of the, the branches to, to Denver, which is a smart thing. If they know that this is going to happen, what a smart thing. I mean, you're in, in, in Japan now, Ramon. Yeah. In the 60s, you may know that the government in, in Japan considered and knew that it was not a matter of, of, of if. It was a matter of when, when Japan was going to be hit with an earthquake slash tsunami. Yeah. And uh, they, they were planning to relocate Tokyo, but red tape took the best of it, and they just didn't do it. And we all know what happened on March the 11th. So anyway, going back to Bechtel, uh, I met with another another guest of mine, and we met at a at a at a Native American reservation. And he was the one who also emphasized the name Bechtel to me, because I asked him, "Look, you are very in touch with with what's happening. Uh, you've been around the world. What do you see for 2012?" And what he said to me was, "Look." If something will happen in 2012, it will not be natural. It will be man-made. And that's, and that's when he said, Bechtel has been building underground bases for decades. And I said, oh, my God. So this is, hmm. you know, more people know about this. And he said it would be the perfect scenario to thin the herd. And I don't want to say this to, to spread fear because I'm the last person you want to talk to regarding fear. I want people to live in awareness, not in fear. But if this is a great moment for them, it will be plausible deniability. If yeah. and we know that they have the ability to manipulate the weather, not only the United States, Russia has it, China has it, so not only the United States. So if this is there, and they say that the world is overpopulated and they're, we don't have enough resources, this will be a great time for them to do it. Plus, we have most, of, most religions, especially the Christian religion, they're expecting something. They're expecting uh, the apocalypse, the, the, the battle of Armageddon, which apocalypse, by the way, only means the revealing, you know, the, the unveiling. Yeah. So many people put it, put a negative connotation into that. And I'm sure that, uh, George Cavasla spoke about this. And speaking of George, George going to be with me this week and next week. We have two shows. We did four hours. Oh, uh, nice. two, great, two great shows. So that's what I can say about Bechtel. Um, with that being said, I saw something on CNN where oh, I forgot the guy's name, where where he he was saying that an alien invasion would actually be good for the economy. Yes, hmm. I Have mean, they're really putting that in your face. Like they're, you know, they're they're not even hiding it anymore. When I when I saw that clip, I, I think that he probably was being mer- metaphorical. Uh, by saying that at the same time, that was mainstream media. He's a, a reputable uh, uh, participant in that show. And the fact that he's saying that really brought me back to two things. Project for Iron Mountain, which, as you probably know, was mm-hmm. presented to President Kennedy. First, Mr. President, we need to uh, always have a black cloud over our heads, a, a, a crisis to keep the economy going and to keep the United States strong, the economy strong. Uh, We have communism now, but after communism is over, we need to think of the next phase, which is terrorism. And then when people don't buy terrorism anymore, and I really just cannot believe how many people still buy it. Now we have the the latest, and I don't mean to undermine the loss of life in Norway, and my heart goes out to all those people and their families there. But when we look at at the... at the fingerprints, if you will, of, of that, I call it a false flag event. The same thing happens uh, with, um, with what happened here in 1995 with um, Oklahoma City bombing. It almost looks as the same, but in this case, it was a bombing, plus the alleged killer went to a little island and killed 69 young uh, teenagers there. So when we have the TV people saying this, that we need an alien invasion, you have to think of Carol Rawson also, who said that Von Braun told him the same thing. Communism, terrorism, a celestial object or a, nat- a natural disaster. And I think this is exactly where we are right now. Yeah. And the next one, the final card, and she kept repeating the final card, mm. will be an alien invasion, a false 
flag alien invasion to finally unite the world so that all the militaries of the world can unite. We create a one world government and we defend our planet against those evil aliens. Don't buy it. Yeah. 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 There's actually a pretty good video out on uh, YouTube called The Quickening, which oh, yeah. uh, addresses that quite well. Which uh, we have on our video link. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We started uh, it, watching it yesterday, yes. Yeah. It, 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 it's amazing. A well done, well done piece of work. So, uh, Let's see. Well, let me finish up with, uh, with uh, Rogue 2's uh, question here. He's only got one more here for you, and then we'll move on to some other things. Uh, sure. of, the very of the various subjects that you've researched and discussed with your guests and listeners, which of them are most interesting or pressing for you at this current time? It's a very good question. I get the question all the time, you know, who's your favorite guest? What's your favorite topic? And I just don't see it that way. To me, what you, Tom and Ramon and Mel do, in my opinion, is finding pieces of the puzzle. I used to think that I knew a lot before I started the show. And after three years, I realized how little I knew. And every time I do a show and I have 10 questions, after I end the show, I have 100 questions. So yeah. it's the opposite happening all the time. You think that you're learning, and yes, you are, but then you realize how little you know about a certain topic, which opens, you open one door, and once you open that door, you realize after you finish a show that there are 10 doors behind it, and then 20, and there's a multiplying effect. So to me, all we do is we have a, a million pieces of a jigsaw puzzle right on the floor, and I see this white wall in front of me. And every time we do an interview, we put a little piece on that wall, and slowly we start looking at the picture and it start making sense. And we start looking at something and we can discern, wait a minute, this is leading me from A to B. And my goal in life is to, when I'm ready to no longer be in this plane and meet with other people somewhere else, would be that day I want to say, I did my best and I tried to complete the puzzle and I think I got, I have a good idea. That, that's my goal. I cannot tell you one topic is more important than others. It depends on the day. Uh, I mean, last week I did a show on, on the economy and silver because, you know, we knew that after the downgrade, uh, the first thing that was going to happen, interest rates would be rising and the dollar was going to go down. So I thought most people really cannot buy an ounce of gold for $1,800. But some people that may still have some money may be able to hedge by buying the, the, the second best, if you will, which I think it's better than gold. That would be silver. So I found somebody I've been in touch with, uh, David Morgan, uh, I call them up and I say, hey, David, can you come on the show and talk about silver and why it's a good thing to hedge the, the value of the dollar? So we did that. Now things get a little bit better this week. But then we're talking about, you know, September and October. You probably heard about the uh, Carl Johan Kalman and, and, and the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the underworlds and the yeah. fact that he thinks and many people think that December 21st, 2012, in my opinion, what the Mayans said, and, and I've spoken to Barbara Hanclau and with uh, Joe Major Jenkins, is just the end of a, an age and the beginning of another one. I mean, December 31st of this year comes along. You're not saying the, the world will end. Now one year will end and another one will begin. However, that said, the December 21st, 2012 may be a date given to us by the powers that want to be. Because what some people are saying is that what's really Starting when this is going to really start is right now, August, September, and October. And they just gave that date in the future so that we are cut off guard. Now, this is some of the information I'm getting. And we can talk about Elenin and we can talk about the, the, the uh, brown dwarf that's coming behind it if you'd like. Yeah. Be before we do that, I want to dive in a little bit into silver. Um, sure. Right now, it's I think 40. Point fifteen is the price I'm getting here, which is great because last week it was about thirty six when I spoke to uh, David Morgan, and uh, gold was oscillating between seventeen fifty and now it's close to eighteen hundred, uh, which which seems like a lot, you know, fifty dollars per ounce, but it's eighteen hundred dollars per ounce. Here we have four dollars on a thirty six dollar ounce 
which is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That that is a lot. And the thing is you can take a hundred dollars and buy a few ounces. Exactly. Yeah. Um the other thing I was gonna ask you about, have you ever heard of um Bitcoin? Yes, I have. I'm not too versed on that, but I did discuss this with Mark Stevens, a great guy that I had on the show a few weeks ago. And and, and I've heard about it, but he explained more or less how this works. I'm still trying to understand the concept of how you see, I'm very, I'm a very black and white person, very kinesthetic. I need to see a system work before I can actually get it. And I want to understand how is it that computers create this uh, way, this currency, uh, which I'm a little, the, I'm still a little doubt. So enlighten me, enlighten me if you know. The way it was explained to me is um, the your com- your computer comes up with a number sequence, and the number sequence is um not prime numbers some oh, i can't remember what it was it's it's a certain um equation that it uses and it only every time you get one equation from that then you can get the next one and that's how the computer makes a bitcoin well to make past um 20 million bitcoins it takes a very large equation and it takes so much computer power. So that's how – so each one has that equation onto it. So you can't fake it because in order to do that, you have to make the next equation. So you need a smarter computer. And that's and that's how they're made. That's how you mine them. So if you really started mining them like six months ago, then you would have made money. Because uh, let me see. What's the exchange rate now? Um, oh, I can't find it, but me and Tom were looking into it actually after hearing your show, and uh, and some some people are starting to use it, but it's still on the up and down. The last time I saw it was seven dollars. Yeah, the first I, time I saw it was at fourteen. I looked at it for a bit, and uh, I just I still don't have quite have the concept in my head. So right, yeah. And, yes, it's a little bit difficult to grasp, especially because it's computer-related. But what happens if, for example, we get a, a a solar storm that takes care of our computer systems? Since the last two years, I've been looking into ways that could replace our current monetary system. And first person I spoke to was Catherine Austin Fitz, and she suggested to create cooperatives around your, your neighborhoods and, and start trading with your neighbors. And this is one thing that we don't do, which is interact with the people that would live around us. I, I always mention this, you know, having grown up in the Caribbean, and, and I know you know, Ramon, oh, the Caribbean, yeah. we get hit by, by hurricanes all the time. But I remember very clearly as a child how, you know, we don't have that much interaction with neighbors, but when a hurricane would hit, we would lose power, sometimes a week, two weeks, no water, that was the time when people would go out with candles and sit outside and bring the food that you had left and give it to your neighbor. And they would bring water and they would sit down and you would really sit down and talk with them as you've never done before. And I just feel bad that this happens only when things go bad. And I think it was the last starfighter or starman that had a great quote. What did he say? He said, you are at your best he was referring to the human, human, humans. You are at your best when things are at their worst. And I wish we could change that. We should yeah. be our best even when things are the best. But anyway, she talked about that. Then I spoke with Jack Fresco and Roxanne Meadows from the Venus Project, uh, whom you probably know. And they had their own way of, of, of uh, you know, their own system, which is not communism and is not capitalism. But the one that I really like, guys, is... The one that Michael Tellinger did. Yeah, I just yeah. that was just going through my head. Contributionism. Yes, con- contributionism, exactly. I, love it. I thought I, I really don't have a hundred percent grasp of that because we didn't talk a lot about it. But I just thought about this. If somebody tries to create something where you can let's say deposit you are, you know, you are a massage therapist or you are, you know, you make um, uh, gadgets. Well, you go to this center and you put an hour of your time and then record that hour of your time. And then if you need anything in their network, 
and you know you need an hour of something, then somebody can come to you. It's even better than barter. You don't need money whatsoever. It's just the, 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 the effort that people have that can put that into a database. And I think it's a great way of, of doing things that could definitely replace our current monetary system if, if the extra met ever hits the fan really hard. Yeah. yeah. La mierda. <laughs> hmm. That's Spanish for extra. Uh, extra. Excellent. <laughs> so what, what, what aspect of this whole genre is is your oh I don't want to use the word favorite but what inter which part, aspect of it really interests you the most what what really gets you going now I will tell you I, I've always had a favorite and it, it, it hasn't changed and it's the topic of uh, extraterrestrial life why because this is the part that motivates me more to, to search for the truth as a kid I would sit down I would go to this little island, you probably have heard it in the news a few years ago, called Vieques, uh, outside of Puerto Rico. The, the Navy had a section of the island that they bombed to oblivion. It's full of, uh, of depleted uranium now. But as a kid, I would go to this section that was not infested by, by radio, radioactivity. And at night camping, I would look up at the stars and I would think, look at those stars. I mean, probably billions of them. I wonder if there's like a, a kid out there in the way of a flipper ball looking down and thinking the same thing I'm thinking. But I was thinking, why is it that when I go to school, they tell me that we are, God made us here on this planet alone. To me, that's the height of arrogance. So I, my passion is to look for, we know that, Flying saucers are real. My goal now is to talk to the contactees, to the experiencers, to those who have really had contact. Because my goal is to one day, and to, to some people, they may call me crazy, I don't care, to sit down with somebody, to a fellow brother or sister from another planet or, or, or galaxy or dimension, and ask one question. My question would be, please tell me what errors you made in your civilization so that we can learn from you. That is my ultimate goal. So, yeah, I'm not embarrassed to say that that is my, my absolute favorite topic. But other people say to me, Mel, you discuss alternative health. You discuss cures, alternative cures, and uh, the economy, and uh, uh, the pyramids. What does that have to do with UFOs? And the thing is, everything is absolutely interconnected. And I say, I mention this all the time. One of my guests who traveled around the world, he went to every monument, and he started deciphering what he saw written in stone and started talking about the technology, anti-gravity. All that is out there for us to use. The ancient ones left that there. I mean, there's another cataclysm right now. In what, a, a, a hundred, a thousand years, everything that man made would be completely forgotten. It would be in oblivion. Well, you know, except for maybe radiation and some plastic and <laughs> things along those lines. But you, you would have that. One night, he got a knock on the door, and he had some people who took him, put a hood over his face, almost like extraordinary rendition. They took him in a van to an undisclosed facility. And he was on, like a warehouse. They put him there in a chair. He had to wait. All of a sudden... Somebody comes and takes his hood off his head. And that person was George Bush Sr., George Herbert Walker Bush. And he said to him, and by the way, Bush is part of what's known as the Ananurb. Google that, Ananurb, which is the Nazi think tank. They went to Tibet. If you see a lot of pictures on the Internet, you see all those expeditions that Hitler uh, sent those people out there. And that, you know, dealing with the occult and technology, some people say the, the Nazi bell and the, the Nazi flying saucer all came from that. Well, anyway, this guy knew about all this. And Bush told him, look, how do you know all this? Nobody knows. How do you know? So he told him, I went around the world and I started looking and, and connecting dots everywhere. That's how I found out. And he was told, you need to stop talking or else. You can talk about the rest, but don't talk about the technology. I think that is the biggest no-no for anybody to talk about. Even when you watch TV, you watch Battlestar Galactica or V or any science fiction shows. I laugh when I see the the uh, the ships. Even right now, I mean, if you if you did this during Jules Verne time and and rockets were not even 
imagine. But right now, we know that we have anti-gravity. But on TV, they always put the rocket propulsion, chemical rockets, yeah. almost as if they're telling us, you know, guys who are making these shows, don't give anybody the idea that anti-gravity exists. Just keep putting those rockets and put those sounds in space, although that's impossible, but people are just not going to believe it. But anyway, just to answer your question, long-winded, but uh, yeah, UFOs are an extraterrestrial life is my, my passion. So... So your ultimate goal would be to interview, and because that's for me, and I think for Tom it's the same. That would be an ultimate goal is to interview somebody from another planet, dimension, or absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Well, well Elijah, my, what's her job? My ultimate goal, Ramon, is still that hundredth monkey, that conscious wave that happens. But uh, but uh, having a, a brother from another world sit down and have a chat with us, that would be right up there, yes. And this has happened in the past. Yeah. I mean, first of all, let me say that I don't use the word believe. You know, people ask me, Mel, did you believe that guest you had on the show and, and or that other one? And I tell them, no, because I don't use the word believe. I don't want to believe, I want to know. You know, things are or are not. The word believe comes from a religious connotation of taking things for granted without any proof at all. And it was Buddha who said, don't believe something because you read it in a book or because I told you or because you heard it somewhere or because it was handed down generation after generation. Go out there. Do your own research. If it resonates with you and it feels like the truth, then you know. That's your wisdom. You know, I have um, a, f a funny story about that. There was a, a guy I, w I was talking to. And he brought something up, and I don't know how we got on the topic of uh, chemtrails and and harp. And he goes, "Oh, that's that's BS." And I said, "China came out and said that it exists." And and then he says, "Yeah, we've had the technology for fifty years." He says to me, "But what you're saying is is, is BS." And I and it just it didn't click. And I said, "Well." He says, I believe in hard science. And I said, well, I believe in doing your own research. And he goes, eh, he just kept going on that he believed in hard science and didn't believe in doing your own research. And I was just like, wait, that's not science. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, they, they want, they want a, 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 when you do, an experiment. They want you to do it in a controlled environment and do it multiple times before you can, you know, say if it works or, or it doesn't. And unfortunately, and I don't mean to frown upon those PhDs out there because I know there's plenty who listen to you and to me, but there's a level of arrogance in academia. Academia, folks, is ruled by the powers that want to be. When they see somebody who's super smart from, from school, they immediately just give him all the perks, come in, we'll bring you to their PhD program, and they want to make sure that you are within the train tracks. And I'm going to talk about one person you probably know, Dr. Paul LaViolette. He was one of those. And he was offered jobs uh, with black projects, and he decided not to because he said, I don't want to work in something that may be hurting humanity. And uh, there's people out there who talk about you know, UFOs and, and come from academia. Those people are brave. The reason why I went to East SETI last year was because I interviewed Dr. Bruce Acnew earlier that year, uh, that year when uh, the Haiti earthquake happened. And that's when he started telling me about his East SETI story, and I just couldn't believe it. Here's this man with a PhD, respected uh, person from the community. He has a company that, that uh, is building electric cars. All of a sudden goes to, to East SETI and has a, a very paranormal experience that he cannot explain, loses 20, 30 pounds in one week, does not use, use glasses anymore, and now it's Jelly knows about it. And that's when I said, I need to sample my, for myself. I'm going to make the trek up to East SETI, and I'm going to see what they're telling me is true. Because I don't, wanna, I, don't, I don't believe anything. If anybody tells me I saw a UFO, oh, that's nice. I'm open-minded. I will never ridicule anybody that tells me even the most rid ridiculous story. I will listen to it. And I will make my own discernment if I believe or I don't. You know what I mean. But anyway, yeah. I went, went to East City last year and saw my very first UFO. And this year I saw plenty of them. And then 
uh, John Kelly, our mutual friend John Kelly, was in the middle of the field, and I went there and I said, John, let's let's just do a quick interview here. Explain to me all your equipment. As we were talking, there was a UFO or two right on Mount Adams for over an hour. I mean, there are no cars up there in Mount Adams. There's, I don't think there's anybody there below zero temperature with a snowmobile flashing the lights at East SETI. Uh, you know, it's just, it's just unbelievable. Yeah, and I mean the strength of the flashlight you would need to, because that's 13 miles away. Right. It's it's quite amazing. Yeah. But speaking of going back to the interviewing of um, aliens, there was the gentleman from the Bulgaria. His name was uh, um, uh, let me see if I could pronounce his name correctly. Uh, Doctor Flipov. Flipov. Flip off. off. There you go. Yep. Yep. I'm really bad at pronouncing last names, and I talk. <laughs> <laughs> He's disappeared since then, by the way. Yeah. Um, which is, I hate to say, it, but I'm not surprised because he claimed. Uh, well, I gotta give credit to uh, Kevin Smith on this. Um, he claimed that they actually interviewed them and had a press like a hidden press conference with different races. Did you hear anything about this? No, I didn't, but I do have my own internal story about Dr. Filipov. I, yeah. I, I wanted to interview him and one of our listeners. Well, uh, actually, uh, we are zeroing in on the top of this hour, Mel. So, cliffhanger. Uh, yeah, cliffhanger for the second hour. We'll talk about uh, Dr. Filipov. Uh, we'll start off there in the in the archives section. So that was fast. Yeah, Are you sure? I, that happens. Uh, you know, we get we get talking, and, and we can always tell when we have a really excellent guest on because it's like we look at the clock and go, "Oh my god." <laughs> Well, I, so, I don't know if you noticed, but Latin people love to talk, and I would just talk all night. Oh, really? Is that what it is? It's, it's ethnic, as you're saying. Okay. No, no. Right. Uh, well, uh, Mel, would you like to leave a, our BBS listeners with uh, any parting words? Well, uh, tell us where we can find you and stuff like that. Very simple. Just go to veritasshow.com. That's V-E-R-I-T-A-S show.com. You can listen to every segment for free. And if you like what you listen, what you hear, you can subscribe and help us. Uh, we are alternative media, so support the alternative. Yeah, and, and I have to say on the whole subscription thing that it's it's very important that you guys support because when I was on the other side, I was like, ah, oh, man, why are they getting greedy? And then when you get on this side, you start realizing you, you spend money on this and you spend money on that. And it's not like the money that you donate or subscribe were, you know, buying luxury cars with. Yeah, that's right. It, it energy all, energy yeah. exchange. There should be some kind of energy exchange for, for this, you know. So. Right. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance. And I know that you live by that also, Mel. And, uh, God, I just love doing this show. How about you, Ramon? Oh, love it, love it. So, uh, ver Veritas.com, correct? Veritasshow.com. Veritasshow.com. And last thing, well, have a good night and listen to us. Oh, make sure you listen to Dr. Brooks Agnos coming up next. And then after his show, come check us out at the archives. All right. Love you guys.